Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us for our weekly webinar. I'm Mark Schumacher, the CEO of the Home Furnishings Association. On behalf of all of our team, I want to thank you for being here. Um, as you know, we have uh, these regular webinars that, uh, that prove to be invaluable for you as you run your business. So make sure to check out myhfa.org. There will be a link to this webinar and all the others there that you can enjoy, share, uh, and hopefully we always like to make sure that you come away with a few nuggets. Uh, today, we are talking about driving traffic uh, into your store. And I, I just wanna say before we start this conversation, that the craziest part of the pandemic in those, in those first few months when stores were reopening, is that when it was appointment only, and it was it was absolutely a different dynamic, mm -hmm. it was interesting to see retailers so used to trying to drive people into their stores, trying not to drive too many into the stores. And so we so we had this moment where it was we had to be careful how we drove traffic. And that was something I've talked to so many retailers about. Well, now that things have have opened up a little bit more, even with the, the Delta variant, we still have a lot of you know great brick and mortar business out there. So today we're gonna talk about the ways today to really successfully help to drive traffic. And we've got three terrific guests with us. And I'm gonna start with, with the way you appear on my box here. We have uh, Audra Shu joining us. She is with Deluxe. It's a marketing firm, particularly specializing in digital marketing. Um, she's joining us. She is their director of strategic partnerships and is gonna provide a lot of great insights. So Audra, thank you for joining us. Um, also, Jonathan Fader is here. He's vice president of sales with Tokyo Marine. Um, they certainly are um, behind many of the tremendous promotions you you hear around the country uh, to help retailers drive drive business. So, Jonathan, thank you for being here. And Mary Liz Curtin is joining us. Uh, she's owner of Leon and Lulu. And um, I love the fact that Mary Liz, that you're sort of the the line below the name, at least on your website, says an adventure in shopping. Which you, you had me you had me at adventure, so I love that. But, you're uh, super innovative, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes as well. So thank you all three for being here. And um, this is one of those moments when I think a great just sort of opening question kind of will, will help us get going here. I'm going to start with Audra. Audra, in recent months, what have you seen as being maybe the one or two biggest changes to how uh, brick-and-mortar home furnishing retailers are driving people to the, to the stores? What's you know, some of these that are a little more nuanced now? What are the things you're seeing? I what we're seeing on our side is that people are having to be more strategic in the types of people that they're talking to. And so instead of just going after anyone or everyone, they're having to be highly, highly targeted. And what we always recommend at Deluxe is that you go after people who are in a triggered phase. And what that means is people who are expecting a baby, people who are moving, people who are getting married. These types of individuals are ones who are in the perfect buying stage for home furnishing. And so we find more and more people are trying to be highly, highly targeted because you're balancing the act of not driving too many people and really focusing on driving the right types of people to your business. So it's becoming more focused is I guess how I would sum up my answer. Okay. And, and Mary Liz, as a, as a retailer, let me ask you, um, what changes have, have you seen? I, I think that, that these answers will give uh, everybody that's joining us today a chance to understand kind of where you're all coming from. But what have you seen as the biggest changes? Because you guys do a lot of really, really clever and unique promotions. Well, we're a little unusual. We are not just a furniture retailer. We also sell women's ready to wear and clothing and gifts and games and toys. And we've got stuff from 75 cents to holy shit, is that expensive? <laughs> uh, and we also have a restaurant and our our whole operation is a destination. People come just to shop with us or they'll come and have lunch and then go shopping. And we have built our business on special events and on having charity events, having a blood drive, having a pet adoption, having a, an artist market where we have 30 local artists come in. And our goal has always been to get 350,000 people to the store on a Sunday afternoon for any of these events. That is not a goal that's working so well, <laughs> well for us right now. So we've had to change our approach our customers are still dying to come for the parties. They're anxious to see the artists and the authors and the jam makers and jelly makers and be in the fashion show. But we're having more frequent smaller events um, so that we feel a little more secure. We'll have 15 artists instead of 30, but we'll do twice as many shows in a year. And it's it's working out all right. So that's almost, in, in some ways, that's kind of like what Audrey said. I mean, it sounds like you're, you're actually focusing more 
you know, rather than rather than just you know shooting this 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 big approach, it's like okay, how can we incrementally get to where we need to we, we need to go? Is that fair? To we're say? not really focusing more. We do do we do do some focusing because Audra's totally right about that. But what we're doing is having the same event, slightly different versions of the same event three times, so that if 500 people come one Saturday and 500 people come another, it's a little safer an environment than having all 1,500 in the same day, which was our previous approach. Gotcha. If well, we didn't destroy hundred. the parking in the town, we felt that we had really failed. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. I love, I love it. Um, Jonathan, let me ask you a question. Um, I know that that you know you all deal on some some pretty you know large scale um, type of situations, but it, it's it's no different um, with a larger retail space or medium space. You're still dealing with this whole concept or concerns that people have about about being in stores and things of that sort. So how are you guys, what are you seeing that are the biggest changes in this landscape that people have to be aware of? Well, I think I would echo a lot of what uh, Mary Liz and Audra said. I think as consumers, expectations have changed. I think retailers have been forced to adopt. Um, so I think from an insured promotion perspective, we were forced to kind of pivot and start presenting options where retailers could be offering these same promotions, but solely through digital channels. Um, now I think we're able to kind of revert back to, or not revert back, but look back at some of the great in-store promotions that we've run and kind of marry the two together, so to speak. Uh, but I, I, again, I think what Audra first said, it, it's all about knowing the, kind of the hooks in your local market, um, what's going to really kind of capture the hearts and minds of your customers and future shoppers. You know, I, I have to tell you that um, I always know we've got a, um, a webinar of, of really high interest when we get a ton of of questions, we've got we've got a ton of them. And I think that what you just all said, I want to just lean into lean into something that is um, that I've seen resonate through this, and that is, and I'll start you with you, uh, Mary Liz. This this go go around. Um, how do you manage this push for traffic and the safety concerns and everything else going on really related to COVID? How do you how do you balance that? Because you know, there's that also this piece of it where you want to be seen as a um, as a thoughtful retailer, um, give me an idea about how you how you balance this marketplace now and this drive for traffic. On all of on all, all of our special events, we've reformatted them where we would have 30 vendors. We now have 15. They're further apart. So the people who are shopping in each of these areas are obviously further apart because they have to be. We've got people masked. We've got you know all of the normal sanitation things every place. And it seems to be self, we live in a place where we're not getting any mask aggravation or bullshit mm -hmm. about eh, eh. people are very respectful. They're staying away from each other. They're wearing masks, they're washing their hands. It's really great to see. But we're also seeing a great interest in people wanting to get back out and wanting to have fun again. They wanna go shopping and they don't, we're seeing, a, although our digital, business has certainly picked up. We're seeing so many people who want to come and talk to a salesperson and touch it and feel it and sit on it and pick it up and get it sticky and put it back in the wrong place. You know, they've missed having that that opportunity for the last year and a half. No doubt. And um, I mean, I, I mean, I think we all feel the same way. Um, there's there's just no doubt about that. Ours is such a tactile industry. Um, there's there's no doubt. Audrey, kind of playing off of, of what Mary Liz just just said, um, talk a little bit about how you approach that that balance piece, um, you know, people are anxious to get out, but a lot of people also still want to feel comfortable. Yeah. So, you know, what we do is we offer um, ways to execute marketing. So whether that's in direct mail or through Facebook or Instagram or Google. So what we tell a lot of our clients is you need to now give all the options. Like, don't make this, as Jonathan said, just an in-store offer. You need to give them the opportunity to um you know, cash in on this in any way that they feel fit because you never know where people are coming from. Like for my mother, she is immune compromised. She doesn't, even now that she has the vaccine and whatever, she doesn't want to go out. She does not yet feel safe. So for her, she likes to have all these options. And let me tell you, she likes to spend a lot of money. So um, I always say, just give people the options and let them do what makes them feel comfortable. And my husband, he owns a cabinet company. So what they do is they offer Zoom appointments so that people can see the cabinets and all the different colors virtually. So again, just give people options, make the customer feel comfortable and make them feel like they can still get the best of things, even though the world is a little 
different and chaotic. So th this is that whole concept, just meet them where they are. Um, meet them where they are. But, but, but you make a great point though, because it's, it's also get, making sure you have all of those, all of those outlets rather than a few years back where it might've been the, the sole push was to get bodies in, in the store. Yes. This is now you're basically saying for those that aren't comfortable, make sure they've got options not to. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, have you seen also some of this kind of balancing act that uh, that a lot of entities have to deal with when it comes to this comfort level and the whole point of driving traffic? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's um, you know, I think out of the, this this time of adversity, we've we've recognized some some great opportunities for retailers, and I think uh, like from from Audra's business. Um, this gives retailers an incredible opportunity to sort of focus more attention to their digital channels and you know work towards building a CRM, building a customer database, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, while still you know never abandoning kind of the, what's tried and true, what Mary Liz was saying about being in the store and missing that. Um, but I think you know we, we've come out of this uh, smarter. Um, and when, however that saying goes, it, the, the mother of innovation is necessity or something mm -hmm. like that. But <laughs> I think I think it applies. I think it applies here. You know, it, it's um, and it's interesting because we've seen um, so many changes in um, even in the how stores are uh, are set up in merchandise now to to really also you know relate to all this. So so I guess you know Mary Liz, from your standpoint, even though you've changed some of these the the ways that you've you know you've gotten these these promotional events put together, um, it it sounds to me though like you're like you're also one of those those retailers who's also uh, adjusting as you go. How important is it to also just not be a one trick pony and to make sure that you're you're absolutely um, learning? I mean, we've we've just heard about data as everything. What what is working and that sort of well, thing? Well, you know, as an independent retailer, we always have to be a multiple trick pony. We always have to make everything work that we possibly can and steal what we can from everybody else and, and just keep inventing and changing. Um, we found that. The shutdown to be enormously helpful. We did some infrastructure things. Like we, our store is 15,000 square feet. It's old roller rink. We repolyurethaned the floor. We could not have done that when we were open. So that was a huge win. Then we finally built a fully functioning e-commerce website, which isn't doing the numbers I'd like it to do, but it is doing numbers and it is serving our customers. And we are attracting people from all over. And even before the shutdown, we were working more on targeted marketing, marketing with our um, point of sale system, we can hit people who buy a certain line or people who bought their sofa 10 years ago or, you know, all the different ways we can slice and dice it to tell people we've got something that they want now. And okay. the thing that has been so interesting to me is the interest the consumer has in that sense of community, in wanting to be back, talking to people and having a hot dog down the street at the Coney Island. You know, it's, it's so nice to see that people still want to interact with each other. They just like to do it from farther apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but hungry for it. I, I mean, there, there's just no, there's just no doubt. I mean, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's great to see when you can actually come up with a way to meet that without, without any concerns, you know, you know, surrounding it. Audra, let me ask you a quick, this is a question that came in. Um, but this is, the question is, I'm interested in what's working for smaller stores throughout the, throughout the country. Mm -hmm. You know, um, obviously everybody's got a little different scale here and everything like this, but are you seeing things that if we can kind of, you know, silo this a little bit, what's, what do you see as working for the smaller stores? So this is what I would say, what works, and actually Mary Liz just kind of said this, she steals from what other people are doing. And I would say that the same approach works. We like to think of it as adaptive reuse. <laughs> yeah, or like either you're stealing or I always tell my kids because they're they're young and they're like, oh, my, he's copying me. And I say, no, it's actually a form of flattery, right? right? So I think what the big guys are doing works. The way that you execute it is just different. So I was actually thinking about, I, I saw that question and I was thinking about how I would answer this. And so this is what I would say. Let's say you're going after, you know that. If you are a new parent, there are a lot of things you have to buy. Oh my gosh, I've had three children and there's just so many things you have to buy. So what a target would do is they would send mass communication out if they knew that you were expecting a baby and just like spend all this money on you and give you all these offers. If you're a small mom and pop shop and you have cribs or you have a rocker or you have these things that a parent might need, 
you still can connect with expecting parents, just maybe not in the same way. So instead of sending out all this digital marketing campaign, you could partner with a Lamaze class and offer a discount to the parents that are coming into the Lamaze class. Like just don't do it at the same scale that these big guys do, but you can still glean a lot of insights from what they're doing and just figure out how to do it on a smaller scale. And even like what Mary Liz is saying, like if you know that, you know, these women want to come in for a party, right? Like make the party focused around someone who might need to buy um, a home furnishing. So just don't do it at a large scale if you're a small mom and pop shop. Does that make sense? Did I answer the no, question? No, I, th I think you. I think you gave a lot. I mean, it's, I, I love the creative mindset and what you just in what you just said. It, that's that's kind of thinking out of the box. Um, you're not competing with the big guy. You're just you're just kind of picking picking your spots. No, I think that's I I, I take notes graciously, and that was one of them. Right. The other note I wrote down was I'm stealing completely adaptive reuse. I think that's. <laughs> I think that's I think that's well, brilliant. Um, I'm going to claim it's mine, and that's adaptive reuse of me hearing it. I guess, you know right? that R and D stands for rip off and duplicate. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I want I want to let everybody know, and I would suggest if, if they haven't to check it out. But Mary Liz, you know what you're talking about, your model there. If you go to Dallas, and if you look at what one of the largest single store locations in the country, which is in Nebraska Furniture Mart in in uh, the Colony, 650,000 square feet their mix you, you could have described part of their store um they're doing a lot of the, a lot of those a lot of those same things just on a larger scale but realizing that it's like presenting so many different options to that customer coming in getting them for something different each time so um that's that's it just it's something for everybody else to think about or to look at jonathan um large medium to larger scale so what are the things that are working do you think right now for for those entities when it comes to this this whole drive the traffic um focus yeah I think when, when thinking about bigger stores or, or stores with um retailers with more locations um i think some some of the triggers like that we talked about earlier i think you they could be a little bit broader um so from our perspective uh, you know i mean right now we, we live in a, a crazy time the weather is changing and couldn't be any more inconsistent. You look at your app on your, your phone to see what the weather is and it changes from 10 minutes to 10 minutes. So I think that, you know, that's something that's that's consistent across a wide customer base um, or, or target target customers. So I think if there's there's ways that we have worked with retailers to, to tie their promotions to weather conditions. And, you know, we've designed those in the form of kind of conditional rebates where if it, snows in los angeles on christmas day then everybody i mean that's it needs to be more believable than that than that but for sake of conversation um everybody that purchased their furniture during sort of a certain period of time then receives that their purchase for free um th those types of concepts always seem to work um and i think you can have a lot of fun with kind of creating creating this this quote trigger um you know if, if there's a local sports team or a local kind of event or festival that's taking place um, in the area uh, that we could very easily design a promotion around around that. Um, you know, if a certain feat happens, or if you can predict the outcome of you know something taking place at one of these festivals, there's a way that we could tie a promotion to that to you know then drive sort of traffic in back in store. Interesting. By the way, for those of you just joining us, um, we're talking about. Um, driving traffic into your store is uh, certainly in this in this uh, COVID world of ours. And we're joined by uh, Jonathan Fader from Tokyo Marine and Audra Shu from Deluxe and Mary Liz Curtin from uh, Leon and Lulu. Um, you know, it's interesting, Audra. It's funny. I've yet to hear anything that the three of you have talked about that is um, rocket science. That is um, a humongous, a humongous, crazy spend. I'm hearing a little bit about not just back to basics, but to really pay attention to your marketplace and to use a lot of what's going on in the marketplace uh, as, as you know, somebody you can jump in on. You want to talk a little bit more about that because you know, I, there's questions coming up here about what should I budget, how should I spend, but I'm not. I, what I'm hearing right now is really more of just really paying attention to a lot of what's going on around you. Yeah, so I think um, the very first thing I would say is when if you're trying to like come up with a marketing campaign, figuring out the budget, budget, what's the market size, et cetera. The very first thing is you need to be clear on 
four key areas is what we would say. So the first thing is, who are the right people for this marketing campaign? I think Mary Liz has a lot of different right people depending on what the event is, but maybe your campaign is really specific to a sale or promotion that you have. So be clear on if I'm running, um, you know, like this may not necessarily be campaigns you do, but okay, if I'm running a back to school campaign, which just happened, who are those types of people? Well, clearly it's going to be parents, right? So figure out who are the right people. Then you need to figure out, okay, what is the right message I should be sending that is tied to these right people? Once you figure out the message, then figure out what your offer is. And the offer has to be a good incentive. It could be win a free t-shirt or win a free, I don't know, bed set with the bed that you buy, right? Like be creative. And then the fourth thing is the right place. Where is the right place to talk to these people? Is it online? Is it like if it's parents, it could be anything. If it's an older population, online is not maybe the best channel. It could be. If it's a younger population, it's definitely online, right? So those that's I would always say start with those four key areas if you feel lost, if you're trying to come up with what to do on your marketing campaign. And that will help you get the basics and then help get some more ideas running. So, yeah, go Mary Liz. I was gonna Something that's worked very well for us. We are not, um, our events are rarely price driven. Twice, twice a year we have a big sale like everybody else does. And of course, then we pull out all the stops and try to chug as much stuff out. But we do very, very well with educational events, like a packing mm -hmm. seminar. Mary Liz travels for two weeks in Europe with a carry-on suitcase. How does she do it? Well, that gets a huge response from people who want to figure out how to do it. It's easy. You just take three things and keep wearing them over and over again, which shocks people, but it works. <laughs> uh, we'll do a promotion also in, often in November, how to decorate your tables and your mantles and other stuff for the holidays, mm. or how to set a table using grandma's china and updating it. All things that people are kind of afraid of and want to learn about. And that positions us as the authority in town on a wide range of topics. And it gives people something that they want and is really helpful to them. The other thing that has been a huge driver for traffic for us over the years are charity related events um, where some charity comes in, we donate the space, they can serve whatever they're going to serve. We give them 10% of the sales that day. They can have a raffle, but it's all about that charity. We find that when we do those things, we never try to make a profit on that event. We just try to make as much money for the charity and the money always comes back to us. So it's a different kind of approach. But I think one of the biggest mistakes so many stores make is everything is today it's 20% off this and tomorrow it's 40% off this. And you're going to get a free one of these. Yeah, well, you can free one of these yourself right out of business. So we've worked right. on figuring out how to do things that are educational, helpful, or good for others. And that really has, has worked out well. Yeah, the, the variety in promotions. You're right. Doing the same promotion every time is annoying. Actually, there's this company out there. I won't say their name but they do 30% off all the time. And it's like, I know you do 30% off. Right. Why would I buy from you now? So I, I love your approach. I think it brings a lot of different types of people in at a lot of different time frames. And um, I could use some help with my mantle at Christmas because I'm not that good at it. <laughs> well, you know, and it, there's this, there is this point where if you don't change things up, you're just anest anesthetizing your customer or your target your target market um uh, jonathan as you hear that discussion um i saw you i saw you making some reactions there we're weighing a little bit on on this whole concept of of you know because what you a lot of what you guys do is, is non-traditional so so talk a little yeah. bit about, about that and why that's so key well i i think to start with with audra's audra's first point i think when when you're looking at your sort of your budget allocations and you you've made your Kind of your media buys whether it's local radio tv online um look at it as more than just an exercise in branding um again to, to let's not anesthetize your clients let's actually provide them with some messaging that is going to kind of resonate um so if that can sort of support some of your efforts that your your promotion your promotional efforts in store um and always be i think changing those up always changing those up i think is really important um, I think with um, 
for, for kind of the, the bigger stores, um, I think be really loud and proud about what you're doing. Um, I, I think that's a great way to potentially drum up some kind of local or regional PR as well, which again, from a media perspective, having that kind of owned media um, really speaking on your behalf is, is invaluable. Um, and if there's some community tie-ins as well, like Mary Liz was suggesting, I, I don't, I think you've got a winning formula right there. Okay, that's, that's, that's certainly I think it's one of the big takeaways that uh, that I've already that I've already noted here. So, um, Audrey, let me ask you this, and this is one of those um, you know questions, and I get it because you've got people listening in on this that are you know responsible for these budgets, et cetera. But you know how um, what do you suggest from a budgeting budgeting standpoint? Um, you know, is it is it just does it just differ market to market as far as uh, which channel you're going to use to you know to drive that traffic in or are you finding trends that we need to let everybody uh, make everybody aware of yeah so if you're a retailer with i would say multiple locations at, um across multiple states your minimum marketing budget to start a campaign should be fifty thousand dollars like that's where we would start and um, what we often do to get new clients um, more familiar with what we do is we call it a pilot. So we do a pilot program and it starts at around $50,000 just to figure out what works, what doesn't work. If you're a smaller operation, I don't think your marketing budget has to be that big. Um, like my husband for his small, it's one shop for his cabinet company. It's not necessarily home furnishing. He spends, I think $5,000 a year on marketing. So um, I don't think it has to be massive, but if you have a smaller budget, you need to be, again, very clear on how you're spending it and making sure that it works. And also don't be afraid to fail. If, and that can be hard. Like my husband always says, I tell him this all the time. He's like, it's $5,000. That's a lot of money for my small business. And I said, yes, take a small portion of it, test something. And if it doesn't work, then test something else next year. Don't be afraid to fail um, and something will pan out. Just believe, also believe in yourself that you have a lot of the answers and that you, something will work out. And I think Mary Liz has the proof that she does a lot of different things. And um, I think you've learned probably over the years, Mary Liz, to fine tune what well, we've works. we've had some real losers. Yeah, Absolutely. right. <laughs> but if you don't have the losers, you're not going to find the stuff. It's like buying. That's right. If you don't right. buy some stuff that you, you know, in six months go, what the hell was I thinking? You're never yeah. going to find that stuff that is fabulous and sets your store apart and sends, you know, it sells like crazy. So you've got to take a risk. You just have to be careful that you've got the money to take that risk. That's all. That's right. Mary Liz, is your, is your focus or spend different now than it was, um, you know, let, let's say, late last year? Um, are you finding that you're that you're using different channels? And you know, since you're so into the, all this promotion stuff, I think it'd be great for people to know kind of it's where you're. It's pretty consistent. We do a tremendous amount of um, email marketing. We have a, a large, clean list of names. People have been following us since we first started. So we do a lot of our marketing through Instagram, uh, Facebook, and that's been very, very successful for us. And our our goal in the last year and a half or so has been to to narrow, to do targeted mailings to specific customers, as we discussed a little earlier. Mm. And then we do stupid stuff. Like the first day it's really cold, we have a 20% off all coats, hats, mittens, and gloves. You're freezing, come and get a coat. People just think it's hysterical and they come in and they buy it or they don't. But it, it's a one day something that we have ready to go. And we like to celebrate dog day or cat day. There isn't a cat day, they're all cat days. But anytime we could do something silly and make them laugh, it always pays off really well for us. Okay. Can I ask and, and, Liz some questions? Sure. Yeah. So how long have you um, operated this store? Uh, this store is 15 and a half years old. You've been the operator all 15 and a half years, is that correct, or the Can't owner? see? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you sound so sophisticated and I'm curious, what has been your evolution? Like, how did you, cause having an email marketing list is like, that's what everyone should be doing. So how did you get on that? Like, what was your evolution to learn? That's what I needed to do. And then how did you- We didn't have any money. It? When we opened our store, my husband and I bought this building. We put every nickel, we remortgaged the house, put every nickel into buying the building, doing the build out and then buying not nearly enough inventory to open the store. So when it came time for marketing, there was no no cash for that. 
So we had an opening mailing list of 263 people. It included uh, the PTA, it included the Neighborhood Association and all of our relatives. And our first benefit was for Gilda's Club of Metro Detroit. Hmm. Well, that gave Gilda's Club blasted our email to everybody on their list to invite them to the to our party. So that's how we started to grow it was really with charity events where we gave a percentage of sales. So if they didn't buy anything, we always lie and we always round up. But um, if they didn't buy anything, it didn't cost us anything. And charity people are nice people. They tell their friends they had a party for us. And then all of a sudden another one comes. At our busiest year, we did 80 special events in one year in the store of all different levels, little ones and big ones. And it it has worked really, really well. So our big issue has been reimagining that to a different kind of a mm. an audience. But the key, but the key but takeaway that, that Audra, the key takeaway that Audra is leaning on here, though, that, that I hope people hear loud and clearly, however, is that's all great as long as you're capturing the data. If you're not capturing the data, you're just doing a lot of great things for your community. And I just love the fact that you're leveraging others, other mailing lists and utilizing that but then capturing the data at the, at, at the other side of it and and audra i have to believe that that's the you guys are a, a data-driven marketing like company. So i can't imagine you're not just saying everybody you, if you're not doing this you're losing out correct yeah. and then yeah. you have to treat it respectfully absolutely treat it i mean that is worth a million dollars or more to you the, those people those people on your email list are so vital to your business, as Mary Liz said, you know, not only do they buy from you, but they bring in friends, they're huge in referrals. So, and she also mentioned a clean list too. That's so important because you could have a list of 10,000 customers, Sure. but if they're sure. not people who are actually buying from you, that's not considered a clean list. Like, well, there are a fair number of other retailers on my list. I'll just tell you that oh. right now. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So like you just it's so it's so important to focus on the information because I always say, um, you know, the more information you have, the more knowledge you have and the more knowledge you have, the more powerful you can be in your business. So, yeah, I think Absolutely. it's amazing. Absolutely. And if I can send an email, sure. you know, they're they're friends of ours now. They already like us. They gave us their email. And if I can send an email to somebody about something she specifically wants, whether it's a baby thing or a new dress or whatever, then I'm fulfilling a need and I'm giving, I'm really doing her a favor. Yes, you yeah, are. You're, you're, you're showing that you're paying attention too. As long as it doesn't come across like you're stalking them, that's one of those things where sometimes the- We try to hey, be really careful about that. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes that's, hey, you're having a baby and you're like going, how did you know? Um, mm -hmm. Jonathan, let me ask you this. What are you seeing also as far as spend is concerned? You seeing changes in in how retailers are uh, allocating their money in, in this in this environment to, to drive folks to the store yeah i mean yes and no i mean i think that like we talked about at the beginning of the, this webinar that i think uh retailers and marketers in general now have been sort of forced to pivot and become much smarter about how they're reaching sort of their their end consumer um so for for when we work with retailers with smaller budgets um you know, we're not bound by kind of any any minimum spend. Um, so we can be really creative sort of in designing a promotion that is going to sort of meet all the, the, the expectations of your consumers based on your market. Um, and then thinking about what, what can you do kind of in kind that, that is of no cost to you. So you have sort of the great grand prize, so to speak, um, but then what else can you do to um, drive people in your store? Uh, we were at a, a, a show recently and we're speaking with a retailer and th this was a point they had brought up, and there's nothing too earth shattering about this, but um, they're interested in sort of one of these big grand prizes, enter to wins, to get people into the store, uh, but then also offering kind of a, a secondary guaranteed prize where there was somebody who's going to win, but they're going to win in-store credit. And that in-store credit, you can almost guarantee that there's going to be an additional spend in-store on top of that. Mm -hmm, um, right. So you're, you're kind of serving both purposes, I think. and and. You know, the, this retailer had a, a really small budget, probably a budget that sounds similar to Audra's husband's store. Um, and I, I just that's, I think, a, a really smart way of approaching um, kind of a, a in-store traffic driving strategy um, where you don't need to completely, you know, break the bank, uh, but it's just spending those dollars wisely. You also said something interesting, Jonathan, and I want you to follow up on this real quick. Um, it also sounds to me like um, this 
this can't just be, you know, uh, the, your sole um, approach here, because it sounds like if you don't have uh, really a, a plan for when that person comes in and, and how you take this, this great, you know, entree that they got there, um, if you're not prepared to, um, you know, provide more than just the, okay, we're doing this giveaway or whatever it might be, if you're not prepared for that, then it sounds to me like it could also fall flat. So you've got to make sure that whatever you do around these promotions is is bigger than just the one item. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think as you're as you're thinking about sort of what what the concept should be that you want to kind of put promote around, uh, you should you should be sort of having parallel thoughts about coming up with a strategy that's going to kind of drive drive engagement around that promotion, and that engagement is what's going to get people into the store, and then I think once the promotion is live, you need to have sort of thought in advance what what's your sort of your mechanism to capture to capture data, um, whether that's you know first name last name and phone number or email address um, to build an email ma marketing database. Uh, I think that's you know you you it's great that you're getting more people in the store, but if you're getting more people in the store and you can't touch them again. Uh, and you can't build a relationship with them, then it's you know somewhat all for nothing. Um, and, and then as the promotion is going on, I think being being really active in your community, talking about what you're doing, um, trying to drum up that that potential local PR aspect. And could we remember that the in-store experience is crucial as well. Yeah. It's not enough to get them in here. It's You've got to delight them when they get through the door. You've got to get right. your arms around them and make sure that they have a fabulous experience and they cannot wait to come back again. And that they want to give you their emails and they want to be part of whatever it is you're pushing. But yeah. too often, I think people have this great idea for, for pull, but then when the person gets in... What are, yeah. like, what are you doing with it? Yeah. Well, the, and, and, you know, you answered, thank you, Mary Liz, you answered a question as people asked me, how do you get people to come back into the store? You just you just talked about that. This is that that focus on the return customer and making sure that experience when you when you spend this money to get them in there and they're in there, make sure that you're that you're creating a customer for life if you can. And by Our the way, the one thing I want to is we don't care if they leave with a bag, but we want to be really sure they leave with a smile. Mm. If they're not happy when they leave, they're never coming back. Mm. Love that. And by the way, the one thing I want to point out just to punctuate it is when when Mary Liz and also Audrey mentioned it as well, talking about you know tying many things you're doing in the store with something out there, whether it's a, a charitable event or whether it's, you know, the something with the school district or whatever, anything along those lines, you know, that also subliminally, if you don't billboard it, subliminally even says we are socially responsible. We're corporately responsible. Mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, I mean, I mean, that part of it to me is just, I mean, that's, listen, that's bringing the local, the brick and mortar. That's your advantage that the big folks don't have when it comes to your particular community. So I think that's important. That's I want, I want can to, I say something? Yeah, can I it. say one other thing? Jonathan said, you know, use your money wisely. And I think sometimes for small retailers, they can feel like if that money didn't produce good results, that it's not wise, wisely used. But, you know, I, ha I saw this saying one time and it said, sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And I think even if you didn't get the results you wanted, it's still a learning experience. Like Mary Liz said, like we had a we had a lot of failures, but it taught us a lot of things. And even if you spend five thousand dollars and you don't make five thousand dollars back, well then you learned really quickly that you're not going to do that thing again because it it didn't work. So try something else. So wisely doesn't always, in my mind, mean that you have to get good results. It's wisely take a wise approach and um, just believe that. It, it, you'll learn something from it, whether you get what you want or not, and just not to be afraid. So yeah, I just thought that was such a great thing to say, to, to be wise about what you do. Well, and Mary, and Mary Liz, let me, let me, let's jump on that a little bit further. And wouldn't you also say that don't, if just because a promotion worked great last fall, doesn't mean you just plug and play this this time as well. It sounds to me, I, I get a feeling you guys look at everything you oh, do. Oh, I don't know. You do it one year and it's an experiment. You do it the second year, and it works, it's good. If you do it the third year, then it's a tradition. So then you just want to do that thing every single year. Okay, all right. We, we are always changing and always coming up with new ones, but if we've got something that's working, we see no reason not to beat it till it's dead. <laughs> How do you measure it? Uh, you measure it by that intuitive feeling of customer engagement as well as the dollars. You look at the number of bodies, and you look at the number of dollars you did on the whatever promotion it was this year and whatever it was last year. But people forget. 
you could do something really cute in November. By next November, if it was good last November, they're not going to remember that that was the same thing. Which we could, you know, it's always tweaking and changing. The images are different. But I think if you've got a winner, it's the same thing with merchandise. If we've got something that sells, we keep ordering it. We, I think too many retailers fall into that everything has to be new trap. And it doesn't. I want something that I know reorders that I can pay our mortgage with, not just the newest thing that just came out that's not proven yet. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of new ways with leftovers and keeping it constantly, you know, if it worked once, make it work again. Okay. But, but, but I, right. like the fact that, but it's a, I like the fact that you're saying it, but it evolves. You're not, you're not saying it just, I mean, I, I love that you're, you know, it just, it just seems like you really are attuned to, to the temperature of what's going on in, on your floor and, and the feel of it. Because like you said, intuitive plus the dollars. So it's, you've got a really, I mean, that's, there's, there's a real nuance there that's important to point out is you really you need to You can have connected. an event where nobody spends anything and you don't know why, but they all left on a high. I consider that a, a successful event. Maybe they're too busy having wine and chatting with each other. It doesn't happen very often, but you can't just, you can't do it just by the accounting. You've got to have the feeling too. Let, let me throw kind of a, by the way, I have to tell you something. This is, this has been great fun because I, I don't even need to be here. You guys are just, I love the way you're organically just kind of talking. I'm just, I'm just sort of superfluous today, which is kind of cool. Um, so I'm going to throw out just, just a thought here and you guys can jump on it and say yay or nay. So a few years back, the term was always, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to really bump up our door swings right? Door swings is a big thing. Just, just getting, getting people in the door. Is that even something I should care about right now? Or is it just a question of base my traffic on more of that results driven and not sit there and say, well, I need to go from X number to X number, but instead that results piece. I mean, is, is the, just the, just the basic number of door swings, does that really matter anymore? Should I really care anymore? Or should it be the quality of who I'm bringing in the door? I'll, what do I'll you start. Do? I mean, I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary Liz. I, I don't know that it matters that much. You want to see a constant influx of new people and you do want to have traffic in the store because it's more fun for all the shoppers when they're not the only one in there. But I, yeah. we can't count our door stings. We have two buildings and we're constantly going back and forth. So my door counter blew up <laughs> and I Great didn't job. replace it. Great job. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's a, I agree. I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think from a, you know, a promotional perspective, um, I think, you want to celebrate your wins so that the you know the idea with any any promotion is that there's going to be an end result there's going to be a winner and if not i think you need to be creative in sort of crafting if somebody didn't actually win the promotion what else can we do to kind of celebrate that this happened and that people participated in it so it doesn't fall flat and, and you don't seem disingenuous to your customer base um we the the retailers we've worked with who have I've really taken this to heart. I've been really successful and continue to kind of create and think of new promotional ideas that can follow a similar track. I hope you understand kind of my, my point of making this is it's not just numbers. It's not just yeah. the number of people in, 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 in the building. I, I think that, that that to me from every from retailers I've talked to is one of the biggest changes in mindset that it's not just numbers and we know we're going to get X percentage of, of sales out of these numbers. We don't have that luxury right at the moment so it's a question of really that whole that whole measurement thing and getting and audrey that gets back to what you've been you've been preaching do, do, you, do you see where i'm kind of going with this yeah so i understand what mary liz is saying like if i walk into a store and it has a really good feeling i want to have another really good feeling again i'm going to go back to it if i have a store and they're like i've had this before I'm in there and they like follow me around. I don't want to be followed around. It's just weird. So I, I am about like making sure that the customers have a great experience. But if you're the, the and when there's more people in there, I generally have a better experience. Um, but I also don't think that people need to work harder. I think they need to work smarter. And that's probably where this is going or in the similar vein in that why do you want like a hundred people in the store if you have like two salespeople? That would seem overwhelming and like a bad experience. I would prefer to send you someone who's going to buy 
or has a high proclivity or high propensity to buy. That's actually what you should care about. Instead of spending two hours with one person, wouldn't you rather spend, and they don't buy, I'd rather spend two hours with someone that does buy. So I don't know, we're all about giving you people that are in the position that to financially buy. And that's all around these triggered events, right? Like someone who's moving, they need home furnishings. Someone who is getting married, they're merging the homes and not all the things work together. So they're gonna buy new stuff, right? So we care about quality, not quantity. And I hope that other people understand that too. Mary, Mary Liz, I'm gonna focus this to you specifically because I think you'll like this. I had a, a great conversation. I'm actually gonna be putting out a, um, a blog post on this, but I talked to a, a very well-known retailer who should remain anonymous because likes to fly below the radar, but been around forever, multiple stores, who said, and I love this line, he said, with all the sad and bad news being broadcast 24 seven, time to be the bright spot. Now more than ever, price is not the ultimate decider, it's make me feel good and I'll make you feel good with my credit card. And I, and I, I like and it. I, yeah, I, I love that. I mean, we really in this conversation have, have shown that this is yes about I mean, Jonathan, Aubrey, you're talking about great promotion ideas. And Mary Liz, you're talking about great promotion ideas and great things to connect to. This is really about this customer that's frustrated right now with the delays and that can be a can just be, you know, just not in the in the best of moods and needs something. Man, make them feel good through what you're doing with these promotions and getting them in. And I, I mean, I can't believe that you're not gonna you're not gonna be hugely successful with that. I mean, I think I, we keep hearing that time and time again. Is that is that resonating with y'all? Yeah, we did a lot of strange promotions during the, the shutdown. Um, I decided that we should have a jingle. So we had a jingle contest and people wrote Leon and Lulu jingles and somebody won $1,000 for the winning jingle and somebody won, I don't know, some, there were prizes and we put them all, well, people had so much fun with it. They, well, we don't actually need a jingle. We're finding that a jingle is not that handy. We don't, we don't use it very much. But it was really fun to do, and it got a lot of people talking, and it brought in people who had never been in before because they knew friends who were jingle writers, and it, it was really one of our dopier ideas that turned out to be excellent. So I we, mean, your chair alone is fun. I just literally, your chair is just so much fun, and it brings me so much joy just sitting here. <laughs> and I, like, I feel like I get the essence of what your store does just by this chair. So I can believe that. I mean, it sounds like an amazing promotion. It was fun. The guy that won it was a hoot. We'll have to share the jingle with us. I, I would be happy to. It's on our website. Okay, great. I was say, if you sing it right now, I'm going to lose it. I just want to point yeah. that out. I'm just going <laughs> to need to get to Leon and Lulu. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, we had an interesting question, and, and I'm going to try. This is going to be hard to, for some of you to answer this without being self-serving, but I want to. I always want to be mindful of questions that come in. Jonathan, I'll throw this to you first. Um, what do you look for in a marketing company to know they're a good choice for your business when it comes to these types of um, this type of traffic driving? Um, try to try to distance yourself from your current situation and give us some give us some nuggets here. Um, I mean, I I think th this resonates with most of what we've discussed today but i think that the the you want to be as far away from a cookie cutter approach as you can be um i think you know no two markets are alike no two stores are alike and you know no two customers are alike you know there might be similarities um but i think your your marketing campaign um or your promotions i guess from our perspective need to reflect that and so we would approach it again i don't without being self-serving and trying to distance myself but um you know we, we would approach it from the mind of the of the retailer um and i think that you know we're we're doing we would be doing a disservice if we present two retailers in different parts of the country with two of the exact same promotions um because okay. so they you're talking about funny price somebody's going to listen to you as a retailer and really contour it to your style i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of entities that might not work well with mary liz because she's got a very definitive brand and it might yeah. not be there. So instead of them trying to make her something she's not. Okay. Audra, again, no self-serving here. Um, yeah. I, I don't think this answer is self-serving. I think find a marketing company and people in that company that you like to work with. Um, 
I feel like business is so re relational and you, if you're going to be doing a lot of things with this company, you want, you want to make sure that you enjoy them. So find someone that you like. Yeah. Okay. Relationships. We're a relationship driven yeah. business. Um, I know we're kind of winding down here, but I, I think this is a great, a great question too. Is, is there a way in these promotions to really promote the value of brick and mortar? I know we talked about it being in multiple multiple channels and in the need for that and to be to be you know to have a vocabulary online etc but can we talk a little bit about that is that something because that certainly isn't the best interest of, of of mary liz you know wanting people to understand that it's a it is an experience and that sort of thing so how do you present the value of a brick and mortar in these uh, in these promotions to, to give the story even more value we just always talk about how we have the answers and you come here, you can sit on it, you can touch it, you right. can see the actual color. And if you buy it online from a pure play internet person, it's going to show up at your curb. And if there's a leg falling off that sofa, it's not going to be like calling Leona Lulu where we hop into our truck and come pick it up and take care of it. And one of the things about furniture is people are afraid when they're buying furniture, they're scared of it. They will go buy a car for $50,000 that they drive for three years and don't blink and they're out to buy a $7,000 sofa and they have a complete meltdown. It's wild. They need help. They need handholding. They need somebody who can tell them what they need and how it's going to work and remind them about a lamp and a coffee table and whether it's going to, and when we can express to them that we can provide that kind of education and assistance and support and help them choose their paint color, all of a sudden brick and mortar is looking pretty appealing. Yeah. Now, Audrey and Jonathan, how do you weave that into to the promotions that you guys utilize as well? That that value of the of the brick and mortar, the tactile approach. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Audrey. I, I was just going to say, you know, we did this promotion during the pandemic for a mattress company, and um, it was all digital. The offer was digital, but what we found is because we can do all this tracking. We found that people who bought mattresses on this um, code were more likely to live near a location where they could try it first than people who lived out in rural community who couldn't try it before they bought. So the try before you buy is so important. Um, and that's just kept what kept coming to my mind as Mary Liz was speaking and these, even as you were asking the question, like. People want to try before they buy. Like if I'm going to be sitting on this couch for the next 10, 20 years, I want to make sure I like it. So that's, you can't do that online. I can't try a mattress online. So that's brick and mortar is so important for ensuring that this is a good investment for you. So whatever campaign you do, you, that you, it should be steeped in that. I mean, is that pretty clear that that's got to be a part of it? Don't assume people are going to, are going to connect the dots on it. No, it doesn't. We actually didn't even say go into the store. People just naturally went into the store. So I guess what I'm saying is it is a natural tendency for people to want to try. And so I think just reminding them and encouraging them to come before they make a $7,000 investment can um, only help you. And it, I just think it's a natural tendency for people to want to come in. But I guess I'm saying don't, don't leave it to... Uh... To chance, though, chance. I mean, it, it could be something that you build for. Jonathan, what are your thoughts? No, I mean, I think, especially at retail, people see better than they hear. Um, so, from the promotion side of things, think about your promotion as kind of you know pouring gasoline in the fire um, to get people into your store and and you know create a a point in the sort of quote registration process and the promotion where there is a compulsion for that buyer to or that shopper to go in store. Uh, and without going in store, there's, you know, not, you don't exclude them necessarily from participating, but maybe it's a, it's a different tier of the promotion that they're then part of. So that, that's, that has worked for us. Okay. Um, um, one other interesting little nugget here, and I don't, I don't know your situation at, at Leon and Lulu, so you can tell me if I'm, if I'm barking up the wrong tree here, but um, there was also, I thought, a great question where, um, Folks are wondering if some of their partners, perhaps like their financing partners and things like that, how much that that can also help to to drive the traffic with the, you know as far as the you know the, the the financing deal and is that something that should be weaved through these and is that driving traffic right now? Is that something that people are are uh, are caring about? Mary Liz, what what's your situation there? We've never offered financing, um, and we've never 
I bet two people have ever asked us about it in our 15 years. It doesn't seem to be important. I'm tempted to try it because I have a good friend who said that it wasn't that people needed the money, but they bought better stuff because they could finance. They spent more because they could finance it, which was kind of interesting. But that hasn't been a, a motivator for us. Interesting. Any thoughts, Audra, for what you what you've seen as far as how those those meld into these uh, to these conversations? Because a lot of what we talked about today is really more about that that customer experience and feel, and not so much the hey, here's the latest latest deal that we have. Yeah, I think if you have a partner and if they're a really good partner, they're going to help you, whether they can help you solve that problem or help you find someone to help you solve that problem. I can't answer everyone's questions, but my number one goal is to find someone who can help you answer those questions. So if you have a good partner, they're going to help you get there eventually, is my thought. Jonathan, any comments? Yeah, I, I mean, I think at, just as you, just as the same way you'd approach incentivizing your customers, I think from a financing perspective, you want to incentivize your financier um, by tying the promotion to it. You know, if you do have a financing partner in place uh, and that's made available to shoppers, then you know th there there could be a sort of a store, an in-store traffic driving promotion tied to financing options. And, and it could be something that they could help finance as well. So you need to make sure that you're checking on that too. There's a lot of a lot of yeah. those types of advantages, certainly with a lot of the partners we have here at um, at HFA, including Synchrony. Um, you know, it's interesting. We always, by the way, for those of you joining us, we of course are going to send you a list of the takeaways from today, and it's going to be a lengthy one because we've had a lot of really great uh, great comments from our from our uh, our panel here. Most of them are repeatable, um, but um, it's been it's been really great, and I, and I just love the fact that we're we're really talking about getting back to some of the basics here, and really talking about um, you know your your attention to your marketplace. That a lot of your promotions deal with things that are community tied, and how critically important that is to drive traffic to your stores. Um, also talking about the fact that when you do that, to make certain that you um, that you have really a solid plan in place to capture whatever data comes in from that so that you can market that. I mean, you know, Mary Liz made a great point of how that's really been helped. Um, Audra talked about the, making sure that you focus on four things before you start any of these campaigns. You know, who are the right people? What's the right message? What's the offer? And what's the right uh, place to communicate it? I think that's really, really critical too. And that's where you can decide where you where you make your buys. Um, and I think that the other thing I found just just really um, very interesting is is that in the past it's always been about numbers of people coming in the door. Now we're talking really about doing things that's bringing the quality in, meaning your best chance to convert that person into a into a customer. Um, and yet, uh, Mary Liz told us a lot about how there are promotions also where sometimes you just get people in the store and you're just making sure that that impression is a good one. Uh, make sure the store experience is going to pay off and is going to match whatever promotion you put out there. I know there's more than that, but boy, we just did great and blasted through this uh, this hour. So I definitively want to thank for spending the time with us today, uh, Jonathan uh, Fader from Tokyo Marine. We thank you for joining us. Uh, thank Audrey you, Mark. from Deluxe, you've been great as well. And uh, Mary Liz, um, I just have to tell you, I, I'm, I'm leaving this just wanting to to visit and just sit in the matching chair there and just talk to you for about three hours. Um, well, we'd love to see you. We can have lunch at the restaurant. Okay. <laughs> Which, by the way, has been the biggest driver of traffic, opening a restaurant in our other building. However, that's a really expensive little promotion. Mm. It, it is, but you know what? You're just, you know, every, it, it, there are so many great creative ideas out there from uh, our member retailers on on just different experiences they're providing in stores and everything adds up to just being something different and unique. And Jonathan, you said something that I preach all the time and that is you can take two retailers, identical size stores, identical merchandise, and there'll be two different stores because everybody has their own nuance and how they run it. Um, so one of the things to take away today, everybody, is be true to that. Be true to who you are as a retailer and what you want to put out there. Because if you're true, you're real. And if you're real, people will keep coming back. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, once again, Jonathan, Audra, Mary Liz, thank you. Um, and thanks not only for joining us, but also remember myhfa.org forward slash webinar. You'll find a copy of this. And uh, if you ever want to talk to us about becoming a member, myhfa.org is a great place also to where you can really um, 
learn everything you need to know about the benefits of being an HFA member. I'm Mark Schumacher. We want to thank you for joining us. And always, we'd like to wish you good health and great sales. We will see you next time. Thanks again. Thanks, Bye. Guys.